Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the research learning series talk with biostatistician part four advanced causal inference and observational studies. I'm the moderator. I'm Rob Ehrman. Uh, our panelists, the important people, the first is uh, Dr. Nick Harrison, who works clinically at uh, Indiana University Methodist Hospital. He's continuing the translational and health services research he began during his fellowship in acute heart failure and non-invasive cardiovascular imaging. He received a KL2 Career Development Award funded by NIH, the Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, through the Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. He graduated from Michigan State, then he did his residency at Beaumont, and then did a research fellowship at Wayne State. For dis sake of disclosure, I also work at Wayne State. I know Nick from that. He got a master's in biostatistics. Uh, he is a great guy. He knows a lot. We're happy to have him here. He's a tenure-track assistant professor in emergency medicine. James Chenoweth, I don't have a biography for, I apologize. Do you want to introduce yourself, James? <laughs> Sure, sure. I, I had sent that in, but I'm James oh. Chenoweth. I'm an associate professor of emergency medicine at UC Davis in Sacramento. I also did a toxicology fellowship and I do addiction medicine. As part of my tox fellowship, I did our master's in clinical research program called the Mentored Clinical Research Training Program. And I also did a T32, the quality safety and comparative, comparative effectiveness research training. Awesome. Welcome. Stephen, I apologize. I also don't have your bio. So if you want to give us the your rundown. Yeah, no worries. Thank you um, for having me. So I'm uh, Stephen Miller. I'm here at Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, assistant professor of emergency medicine. I am one of our uh, APDs for the residency program and um, finishing up my master's of um, biostatistics with a uh, focus in clinical research. I have a big interest in you know this topic as well as Bayesian statistics and teaching these things to med students and residents as well as those in fellowship. So one of my big hats is education in this area. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Excellent. Welcome. All right. And then finally, last but not least, we have Martin Wegman, um, who's the research director and a practicing emergency physician, population and population health scientist at HCA Florida Orange Park Hospital. He is the Senior Research Fellow at ASAP, who provides strategic direction for the college's research portfolio, including multiple funded projects, the Research Forum National Conference, and the Members Research Training Course. I actually did that when I was a fellow. It's a great course, highly recommend it. He completed his MD, MD PhD at the University of Florida with graduate work in epidemiology and health care policy. This was followed by a uh, postgraduate clinical research fellowship at Yale and emergency medicine residency at University of North Carolina. He has been published in Lancet, JAMA, Health Affairs, funded by NIH, FDA, private foundations with a lot of research money, more than a million dollars. He has expertise in quasi-experimental design and exper excuse me, experience in analyzing large healthcare data sets to inform healthcare practice and quality. All right, so we have an outstanding panel here to talk about what's a really interesting uh, field in research, uh, causal inference, particularly uh, with a focus on observational data. So um, starting really broadly, I guess, you know, we're going to get into some of the like the nuts, nuts and bolts of some of the specifics later on. But I guess the, the, the biggest thing is just for people who don't, who are less familiar with this is like, you know, what exactly is um, causal inference? And, you know, everybody's kind of heard the like correlation is not causation, but, you know, kind of operationally, like, what is that, you know, what does that mean? How does it kind of, how do we think of that in, in emergency medicine research and um, sort of like broadly, like how, if, or how do the methods differ in terms of like analysis? So I, I think we can just kind of go around to is a, is a starting point. I'll start with Martin, because you're in the top left of my screen. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So, so how, I, I think the, the way to situate causal inference is to first understand what inference is. Inference is drawing conclusions from usually from data. That's how we how we make kind, kind of con conclusions. We're usually empiricists. So we're doing studies, we're getting data, and then we're drawing conclusions from those data. So it's important to know that a, a study in and of itself isn't one that's causal or not. It's, it's related to the inference, the conclusions you're drawing. You can draw multiple conclusions, multiple inferences from a study. Some may be causal in nature, some may be more descriptive in nature. 
some may be predictive in nature. So those are the three big buckets of conclusions or inferences you make from most studies. Ones that are purely descriptive, seeking to make kind of conclusions from a sample about a larger group. Predictive, which are ones of prognosis or diagnosis. And then causal, which are typically trying to answer the question of whether or not a certain type of intervention results or improves outcomes of some sort, or whether or not a certain exposure results in certain outcomes of some sort. So smoking causing lung cancer or whether or not, you know, TPA actually improves outcomes in stroke. So hopefully that provides a bit of a context and I'll, I'll kind of hand it off to my next, you, I think you posed a pretty broad question there. So I'll hand off the rest to some of my co-panelists. Yeah, I, I can jump in. I think how Martin described it is really, really excellent. And in particular, I think Martin, what you hit on there, part of that about causal inference is really closely tied to the idea of intervention and treatment is very important because you know, hopefully everybody's heard again, like Rob said, you know, correlation doesn't equal causation. But if you take a step back from that and ask yourself, well, why do we care? You know, what, what is it that makes it that we want to know causation and not correlation? If we have, you know, those being the two kind of basic forms of association between two variables, why do we care which bucket this association falls into and what direction it goes. And the answer is, if it's non-causal, then you can't intervene on it. If it's causal, then you can attack the cause and you can intervene on it. And if you, you kind of step through that logic, you start to realize that everything we do in healthcare, as far as an intervention, is directed at cause and effect. Right. I mean, that that's how you change things. That's kind of just getting metaphysical here for a second. That's kind of just how reality works, too. But I think like that's that's an important point. I can't underscore enough that you actually don't need causal inference for all research. But in order to understand causal effects versus correlative effects, you you're doing so so that you can set yourself up to then make an intervention in the future as for like what you know, operationalizes causation. I think this is something that a lot of people maybe might underappreciate because we're kind of, I feel like the general, like kind of medical school, clinician, epidemiology primer sort of tells you like, well, causation is a randomized trial and that's it. You're done. That's it. Causation is you had a randomized trial. It said so. But that's not it. You know, that's not really how causation works. And moreover, there's lots of uh, criteria that can support something being a causal relationship that have nothing to do with experimental design. Um, the most famous are Hill's criteria. They are, you know, in no particular order of importance because they're not all necessarily weighted equally. Strength of association. So, for instance, if you have two factors that are associated weakly with one another, like an odds ratio of 1.1 between two categorical variables versus 20, you know, stronger association, you're going to have a stronger basis for inferring that this is a causal relationship. That said, that on its own doesn't mean anything because you don't know the direction. Consistency of association. So are you seeing that these two variables are associated in multiple different settings and under multiple different conditions, and they're always coming out associated with one another. Specificity of association, you know, is the, the exposure, you know, very specific to the outcome. One that gets, uh, I think like a thalidomide is like one of the one, thalidomide and phocomelia are like one of the ones that are, you know, kind of the classic example, I think that I got when I was in my biostats degree. Probably, you know, what I would argue is actually the most important temporality. So you you physically cannot, again, getting kind of metaphysical here, but you, you can't have a causal relationship where the cause happens after the effect, right? Like, so temporality, time, causes always have to happen before effects so far as we understand how the universe works. That's one that I think we often don't necessarily appreciate a lot in research because a lot of research that we do is not actually truly temporal. We do a lot of obviously cross-sectional research, but we also don't do a lot of repeated measures research, which can add to that. And then 
You have things like dose response, biological plausibility, coherence with no knowledge. You know, does it fit within what we know about other things? Experimental evidence, which is, do we have a experiment, meaning a clinical trial, generally a randomized trial, showing that there is support for a causal relationship? And then lastly, analogy, meaning does this causal pathway that you are, that you're hypothesizing, are there analogous known causal pathways that are more well-established? And if there are, you know, you can kind of increase your level of inference a little bit. I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add to that or. Well, I was just saying, so, I mean, that's, those are good, good <clears throat> overview kind of backgrounds. And then maybe for, for, for James or Steven, right? Like, how do you. <laughs> That, that that's that's a lot of words, a lot of things. Like, how do you operationalize it? How do you how do you if I as a researcher want to sit down and saying like like how do I map it out? Is there a way to do that, or do I do I do a checklist, or is there some other way that you kind of think about kind of going through those that 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 list or those those ideas? Yeah, um, just as as a little further background on that, William Bradford Hill is the guy who came up with those criteria, and he described those in a speech that he gave, and it was it was kind of about his essentially discovery of the correlation, the connection between smoking and lung cancer. So he was the guy that was responsible for that. And then he's like, here are the things you can look at to help establish that criteria. Something that's um, sometimes skipped over is that in order to even start applying those, you need some scientific data to say there's a correlation. So you, you're always starting with some connection. Um, it becomes kind of difficult with some of this type of observational research that we're trying to do. In particular, the one that I think is hardest is temporality. And the classic example of that that I always think of is uh, the connection between radiation from CT scans and, and cancer, right? The, the hardest challenge that they've had for trying to establish like a consistent connection, because like it meets a lot of those criteria, right? Radiation, we know it can cause DNA damage, it can lead to cancer. Uh, but the temporality component of the CT scan is always a challenge because are they doing the CT scan because of symptoms related to a pre-existing disease process, or is it the CT scan that's causing the, the later cancer? And they try to build in various things, but it still becomes kind of messy when you don't have like that, that amount of data. And so that's why even, even with some of the strongest data that we have, there's always still going to be a little bit of a question in the back of your mind regarding actual causality. Because in most situations, we can't do a randomized trial. Like in my world of toxicology, I can't poison people and then try things out and see if it works, right? Like it's it's not, not ethical. It's not anything we're allowed to do, at least not anymore. They used to. They used to do it all the time. Usually they did it to themselves, <laughs> but can't really do that. And so you have to take all of these aspects. We use a lot of these different things, including analogy in my world of, is there a sim similar chemical that causes something? Okay. I can, I can say that this one probably will cause the same things because it does this and this and this. I don't know if Steven wants to add anything onto that. No, I mean, I think that's, I think going through all of that is um, hitting so many of the topics right on. I think Hill's criteria is that it's a guideline and, and you kind of go through and even Hill, as he kind of reminiscence on coming up with those, will talk about how there are strengths and weaknesses to all of those. And, and certainly none of having all of them doesn't mean that it's causality having none of them. And you can kind of get into that. But I, I think maybe moving to you know, the different frameworks of, of causality, one of them kind of being graphical. So when we talk about how do we kind of start moving into the statistical mathematical realm of this, and then kind of getting an idea of going from treatment to outcome, then adding into a factor that we'll probably highlight and talk more about, but, you know, confounding and controlling for those types of things. But for those that are not familiar, so Pearl, uh, Judea Pearl is someone who came up with a uh, concept of directed acyclic, acyclic graphs, so DAGs for short. And these are an opportunity to kind of explain and explore causal relationships between variables. And so you'll see these, these are kind of, they put um, nodes. So you'll have X going with the directionality of an arrow into Y. So your treatment going into the outcome Y. 
And, and then you can kind of add from there, but I don't know if we want to explore that kind of framework a little bit more and, and, you know, what that, what that means, if, if that's um, where you're thinking, Rob, but that's where I would kind of take it next. The other framework is a potential outcomes framework. And so that's more along the lines of kind of Ruben and, and coming from that, um, that area, but I, I don't know if others want to chime in or if we want to. Yeah, does someone have, I mean, right, like if, if you, it's, you can't <clears throat> read something about causal inference or, you know, listen to something about it without somebody talking about a DAG. And so it's definitely a visual thing. I don't know, does somebody yeah. have a, like an easy example? I have like a paper pulled up, but it's, it's like a complicated one. I don't know if someone wants to put it up there. We'll do it right now. Yeah, yeah. perfect. That's awesome. All right. Yeah. It's a DAG from a project we did not too long ago. I don't know if it's big enough on the screen here. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe you could just sort of sort of quickly go over what the different, like what the different nodes mean, what the different arrows mean, you know, again, not, not necessarily in the context of this specific. Yeah. So, so first off, this was made in a, a free online software called Dagony. So highly recommend you just, you know, you go there at some point after watching this video or while watching, you know, watching this and, and explore for yourselves and build out your own DAG. But um, this study was seeking to look at the effect of a discharge prescription for skeletal muscle relaxant, like Robaxin or similar medication on revisit rates to the ED for patients with back pain, low back pain. And so we were seeking to identify some potential confounders, you know, some yeah, as well as other factors that might be kind of related to this relationship. So it's kind of first to kind of mention, so these are nodes, these circles are nodes, and they're connected by edges. And these are directed, meaning the arrows only go from one node to another. So that's that's kind of where that whole, and there's no, there's no cyclical nature to it. So there's none of these, are, you're not going to be able to go around in a circle at any point. So that's an acyclic, so a directed acyclic graph. And so what we want to identify when we're trying to recognize what, what might be a confounding variable, a variable that could be both related to the exposure of interest or the treatment of interest, as well as the outcome of interest. And there's a certain type of relationship that would define a confounder versus other types of relationships that are important to identify, but also wouldn't be things that you'd want to control for because they can that can induce bias in your estimation. So these are just some factors that we identified as potential confounders. So patients who maybe are using opioids at baseline, they might be more likely to revisit within a couple, a few days, and they might also be more likely to get a prescription or less likely to get a prescription for skeletal muscle relaxants. Gender, age may influence whether or not people are prescribed these and whether or not they revisit within a few days, as would kind of underlying health status and whether or not they have a musculoskeletal disorder, their BMI and the degree of pain that they're having when they're being discharged, that also is likely to play a role in, in kind of in both of these. And some of these things we have measurements for and others we don't. You know, if we are using retrospective EHR data, we may not know what the exact pain score was at discharge. We may not, you know, have complete capture of their opioid use. And so, but this helps us get to a point where we can start to have conversations about what we can and can't control for. So I can leave this up here if others want to kind of mention anything additional regarding this, maybe some of uh, the other relationships that, that can exist uh, beyond confounding relationships. Yeah. So thanks, Ryan. That's a really good example, Dag. It's relatively, I think, relatively easy to understand, at least in, in terms of like, you know, emergency medicine topic areas. I think some of the things to to note here, you do have potential confounding it. You also have mediated, you both have mediation from the exposure to the outcome. So going, for instance, through gender to revisit, and you also have mediation of some of the confounders themselves, you know, going through SMR to gender to pain severity, and then back to back to both. So it, you kind of have some complex things in there. Mediation is, you know, where you have an inter intermediate factor here that generally we want to understand if in between the exposure and the outcome, there's something that is accounting for some proportion of the transition state that's in there. And in particular, we want, we're usually estimating like a percent mediation. So how much of the relationship between X and Y is um, mediate. The other thing here. So in, in a good example of mediation, perhaps in this case, let's say that, you know, just that prescription for a skeletal muscle relaxant isn't related to insurance status. That might be a little bit of a stretch, but let's say that's the case, or 
or it, but but if 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 that if we can make that assumption, then it might be perhaps that the relationship between skeletal muscle relaxant prescription and revisit or not might be mediated through their ability, a patient's ability to pick up that prescription and fill that prescription, right? And so that might be kind of one one pathway. And so you might expect that you know whether or not they have the funds to pay for this or not is going to kind of influence that relationship. So just to give an example, yeah, for sure. Or another one I was just thinking of is like you know, in between, I mean, technically in the way you have it set up, SMRs are sort of mediating ED physician and revisit, but pretend we're just thinking about, you know, if you were to take just the first half of this DAG and what you were interested in was ED physician decision-making to prescribe an SMR period compared to prescribing other things, you know, you could imagine that having having that the SMR pop up in your EMR, like right at the top, that could be a mediating factor there compared to something else where you have, you know, other prescriptions that are, that are more readily available. I think one of the other things, you know, one of the other important relationships to talk about that isn't necessarily related here, but moderation. So moderation is when you have one variable that changes the relationship between two other variables. So if you are at all familiar with doing a little bit of regression analysis or even just doing subgrouping, you know, descriptive statistics, even though it's not exactly the same, it's sort of the same I relative idea where, you know, the relationship, for instance, between say opiate prescriptions and return visits maybe is very strong in men and very weak in women. And so then gender would be the moderating factor there. Um, and it would be in regression terminology, it would be the the interaction term. I'm trying to think of others. I mean, do we want to talk about like closed versus open pathways here too, or? I, I think just real quick, I think the utility of, of the DAG is that it really lets you visualize all of the different factors that can affect both your intervention and your outcome in these interventional trials. Because a lot of times, you know, people think that they're, they get all this data and then they just throw it into a model and they're looking at, oh, here's my one intervention. Here's the things that affect the outcome without thinking that, oh, maybe some of this stuff actually will affect whether or not they get the intervention at all. Kind of those things trying to control for some of those aspects or at least visualize the potential interactions that all these things can have and kind of show how complex it is to actually determine the the cause and effect. Yeah. No, James, that's that's a great point. I think that actually is a good lead in to at least one practical aspect of open versus closed, you know, causal and non-causal relationships is they're without getting you know, without pulling up too many different DAGs and showing the different examples, there are ways in which throwing all of your variables in a model can introduce spurious non-causal relationships in the model. You know, things like collider bias and stuff like that, that are, you know, going to create problems because a regression model in particular mm -hmm. is, assumes always, and really all statistical modeling for the most part, assumes always that your causal model is correct. Beyond your causal model being correct, then it's mostly doing association. And if you misspecified your model, you can actually get, you know, you can include variables that may be, that's one reason, again, why selecting variables by statistical significance is such a problem. One of the many reasons why it's such a problem. You know, you can create spurious correlations that really don't represent anything useful. Yeah, no, this is a good discussion. And so I, I, I like where this is going. And so this is just an example of like how kind of complex sometimes these get. And so my question for you guys is say you, you have a DAG, right? Like, what are you actually trying to, what are you trying to get? What's the output? What, what am I, how do I, how do you take something like this that looks, you know, perhaps a little abstruse and turn it into causal inference? Like what is the, yeah, I mean, what do you when you and again when you say causal inference, you, you kind of define what that means. But is like a statistical output or an output of a model. Like, what are you actually trying to? What are you actually trying to get? Like, what's that the, the output or that like the end result? But you know, when you say like a cause, like okay, but what does that mean more specifically? I guess. Actually, Martin, do you want to bring up your DAG again? You can show 
in Daggety, the the sidebar. I think that's probably a good example there. I mean, I guess, you know, the general idea is to kind of keep, you know, to keep moving this forward, like what are causal effects? Like, what are we looking for? Like, what do you report in a, in a paper? How do I know if I'm reading something like, is this a causal effect? Like if I read a, a paper and it, and it, you know, it puts, it spits out a bunch, you know, there's a bunch of regression coefficients. Is that a causal effect? Or if I read randomized, you know, results of a randomized trial that says like mortality in the intervention group was... 8% and in the control group, it was 15%. Like, is the difference the causal effect? I guess that's kind of where I'm trying to, to go with it. Right. Okay. So that's sort of a slightly different thing than where I was going. But so stepping back, I guess for measuring a causal effect, this gets into this gets into the problem of what can be kind of hard to understand, but I think is really important. There is a capital F, capital P, fundamental problem of causal inference, which relatively simply stated is that you can't ever observe more than one possible outcome in real life. So if you give someone TPA, for instance, and they have, you know, and they don't have a disabling stroke at three months, you did not observe the possible outcome that you gave them TPA and they had a disabling stroke at three months. And the same thing for the no TPA group. Because you can't observe both, so you can't observe specifically the counterfactual, you can't really know at the individual level, you can't really do causality at the, at the individual level. So really what we're doing when we're measuring causality is we're measuring average treatment effects. So like to Rob, to your, I think where you were getting for a randomized trial, that is roughly speaking with some limitations that we'll get into the average treatment effects on the treated versus average treatment effects in those who aren't treated is what we are ultimately getting from the, the main headline trial results. So there's a lot of assumptions that go into a randomized trial. We often don't meet those. But theoretically, the observed difference between the groups is balancing out all of your confounders. Now, really, it's only balancing out confounders at the exact time of randomization and not thereafter. But you're getting, you know, your, your average treatment effects. Really what you actually get, the observed difference between groups in any comparison is some combination of average treatment effects plus selection bias plus heterogeneity of treatment effects. So when you have a randomized trial, we assume that selection bias is taken out of it, which from an internal standpoint, it's true at the time of randomization. You know, we randomize to ideally balance baseline confounders. You know, as far there's sampling bias that can come into that too, that's an issue, but put that aside for a second. And then heterogeneity of treatment effects, we kind of just say, and eh, we assume there isn't any, which is a problem, but that's what we do. And so then in a randomized trial, we assume, okay, well, the observed difference between two groups is your average treatment effect, which is what you're really trying to measure from a causal perspective. In observation, in observational data, you have to go one step further. You are not having that baseline randomization, that baseline balancing by confounders. And so therefore you need to add in some kind of way to adjust for selection biases. So when you're doing covariate selection for a model, for instance, you know, you're, you're trying to balance for baseline confounders in it for baseline confounders that are causal can causally associated and not in a non-causal association because you you can end up you want to make sure that you're not getting things like indication bias for instance like the james's example about you know how hard it is to prove radiation and cancer in uh, cts for instance because people who get cts are more likely to be more sick stuff like that and then you get into time varying components too yeah so, essentially like the the biggest problem that I see with the observational and getting to true causality is that there's no good way to control for the variety of human experience. There's all sorts of inputs that everyone has throughout their lives, including genetic and, and environmental and all sorts of inputs that they have following that. 
and you're trying to figure out a way to control for all those aspects. And randomization is one way that they try to do that. It's never going to be perfect, but it's kind of as good as you can get. And then an observational, I mean, there's really no real way to do it. There are some methods that we'll get into that try to mimic that, but it only can get so far. Stephen, did you have any thoughts as far as the RCT versus observational data problem before we yeah, get it? Yeah, no, I mean, and and I think I think your question still is the the fundamental interest one, right? Can we ever say that we've truly proven causal? And I and I think that's on the researchers aspect to we have to present our science and we have to present our methods. And if we do a randomized controlled trial, have controlled for all of the variables that we can all agree upon at the end of the day, you know, the chances of that difference that you found, the mortality is better with the treatment than it is against the control. I think you can at least make the argument that we've done our best and that's what's out there. And if your population has some similarities to this population, I think you can, you can go with it where observational trials come in kind of fills in the gaps where you can't do a randomized control trial on everything. We would love to, but you just can't do as, as James pointed out, the, the uh, poisoning is not allowed. They also, there's cost factors. There's um, the ethical considerations, there's just the fact that sometimes um, we don't have the resources to put these in place. And, and we have lots of opportunity to look at observational data. And so we have to find methods that do the same thing that the randomized control trial allows, but we have to just be smart about it. And, and the big, the, the big you know, factors are selection bias. So are our groups comparable? Com com comparable? So if I have an observational trial and I have my treatment group that got, you know, X treatment and my control group, are they different in too many ways that I can say that their difference is something meaningful? So maybe one group is younger, one group is older, and how do I account for that? And, and so, you know, some of the methods that we start relying on something like propensity score. So this is the probability that a group got a treatment and we can mathematically and use statistical analysis to give each individual a score on what their probability of getting that treatment is. And then we can start comparing those scores in different ways, one of which is matching the scores. And we take the, the group that is treatment and we took the group that is control and the scores that are matched close together we put them together and we kind of start throwing out the rest, um, depending on which method you're using. And then we use that as our uh, actual sample population. And then we, we can kind of say, hey, yes, the, the groups were different at the beginning. Now they're similar. And now the outcome that we have is more meaningful in this kind of you know journey towards a, a causal causal relationship. And there's several different other methods that I, I think, Martin, you're have a lot more background in, in some of these methods, but, you know, I, I think that's at the heart of it, but I, I, you know, going back again, Rob, to your question of how do we know where causality is? How do we, how can we say that this, this treatment is causal to this outcome is a difficult one, particularly with, with observational, uh, observational data. Yeah. yeah. I mean, build, building on that, or, or sort of in response to that, I guess I'd like to hear what you guys think, you know, the, we all probably learned at some point, right. You saw the, like, we learned, we, we're shown the evidence pyramid in on the top or near the top or you know randomized control trials. But as Jim said, it's just like it's just not feasible, practical, practical for like any number of reasons. So is there, you know, one, should we consider that like RCTs, if they're, you know, well done, and I, I don't know what the criteria for well done is, but like if I read an RCT that's in like New England Journal and it's randomized. Should I like, should, do we consider that the effect that they have found is causal? I guess that's like part one and part two is, you know, what in terms of the sort of grading the, the quality of sort of causal inference you can make from observational studies, like how, and it's probably an impossible question to answer. There's no real answer, but like how well, and maybe this gets into some of the methods, but like how well can observational data sort of approximate or the methods for, for handling observational data sort of approximate RCT data? I can start with some of that if you want me to. Is that okay? Yeah. And I like, I, this is what I call my spectrum of quasi experiments. I mean, 
it's not it's not so empirical. I guess it's more anecdotal in in nature. But so when you're thinking about what the the main threat that we're talking about, we're talking about a threat to internal validity that there's that there's bias and that there's some sort of you know some sort of effect that is that the effect that we're estimating is not is not um, exact. It's off um, because of either confounding or other other kind of selection issues. So, you know, oftentimes we see studies even that are published in this kind of no adjustment zone, which is highly concerning for bias. You know, covariate adjustment is is probably the most commonly performed by most of the, you know, introductory researchers, even like mid-career, even senior researchers still do kind of mostly just covariate adjustment, which involves just putting variables into your regression model and saying, okay, I think these are confounders. I think they've adjusted away the, you know, the, the problem. And so I have my effect estimate. And I, I, I think most would consider those to be relatively weak ways of controlling for confounding. You know, matching is, is getting a little bit stronger. Matching can be done in several different ways. One of those is with propensity scores. You can also weight with propensity scores. Those are probably the two best ways to use propensity scores. But then you start to get into, you know, these other that we've been kind of hitting at instrumental variables, regression, discontinuity designs, interrupted time series designs. And, you know, if you have the right context for your study, these can be quite powerful methods and can can really can can really give you a lot of confidence in your in your ability to, that that you're that you're not you know being affected as much by confounding or selection issues. A good example of regression discontinuity that that you know we can walk through examples for each of these if if desired. But regression discontinuity, a good example for our field is when you have a very hard administrative cutoff and on one side of that cutoff, you uh, get some some treatment or some something, and then on the other side, you you don't get that. And a good example of this is D dimers, right? And in kind of conventional D dimer threshold of zero point five for many places or five hundred units, depending on you know what your units are. And at that level, you know above that level, you get you get a CTA almost uniformly, right? And below that level, you do not get a CTA almost uniformly. But you know, there's reason to believe that the people on either side of that 0.5 aren't really that different, right? So 0.49 and and 0.51, those those people are likely very very similar to each other. But one is almost certainly getting a CTA, and the other one is not. And um, so you have this opportunity to kind of study not necessarily the effect of CTA, but the effect of contrast on nephropathy. So you can see kind of how you have to find these particular contexts. But so, you know, there's there's a good study in JAMA on contrast nephropathy looking on either side of that 0.5 for the D-dimer and saying, OK, what happens to the kidney function for people that, you know, got exposed to this contrast versus not? And and so that, that's just kind of one example, you know, of of how these designs can be kind of pushed but it requires specific context. And so, you know, the other thing that kind of I want to make, and while we still have time, another point I want to make is there's something called target trial emulation. And I think it's a pretty important concept because it can pr protect you from making kind of key errors. I'm trying to see if I have, I have a quick maybe framework to, to help you all. Yeah, here we go. I can just share my, switch my share to this screen here. Um, I also just put a, a link yeah. in the chat to like a great paper um, by Miguel Hernan in the about target trial framework too. Yeah, perfect. So like I I really like this framework because I think it's very intuitive for those of us who are you know raised in the medical education where RCTs are like this gold standard, right? And so we understand RCTs pretty well. Maybe we've participated and helped out with them. We've read several of them. So you define your study with with a target randomized trial in mind, meaning you define kind of eligibility criteria, you know, for example, you know, with the back pain, you know, you might, you might say, okay, I want to take people that are discharged from the ED, didn't have, you know, were low acuity, so didn't have any of this testing done, and were diagnosed with back pain on discharge. So that that's who I would enroll in an RCT. So that's why I'm going to in, enroll, quote unquote, in my retrospective observational study when I look back at my EHR data. Then you kind of need to define carefully your treatment strategy. In this case, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. Did you get prescribed skeletal muscle relaxants or whatever the target prescription is of interest or not? You know, did you and and so kind of the, the treatment assignment occurs at ED discharge. It's very clear. Like when you get discharged, that's when you get your prescription versus not. You know, we very clearly have our our start and end times defined here, which is a key problem that kind of gets overlooked in observational work. You know, everybody 
talks about confounding and how big of a problem confounding is. So, uh, you know, having unmeasured, some unmeasured variables that are influencing the outcome, you know, and that are related to the exposure of interest. But another key problem is people often include knowledge in the future in defining their cohorts. So for example, you know, in, in this, in this setting that I'm sharing here, if you said, I'm going to define my eligibility for this observational study as I'm going to exclude anybody who was later admitted to the hospital that was that was admitted to the hospital three days later, or I'm going to exclude anybody who later, I don't know, who got who who saw their primary doctor within a few days or something, something like that. That's knowledge in the future that you wouldn't have if you're running an RCT. You would only know what's what's happening right at this charge. And so by doing that or conditioning on that, on that extra on that extra variable that's in the future, you're you're effectively you're 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 inducing kind of bias into your into your analysis. So this helps in kind of helping you avoid making that mistake, that key mistake. And it also helps very clearly define when is the start time. Because often when we have, for example, L we're giving albuterol to kids in the ED who have bronchiolitis and we're trying to figure out if that impacts things or not. What is the start time for that trial that kids would be getting albuterol? Do we start it when they hit the door? And how do we know who's in the intervention group when they hit the door or whether or not they're in the control group? Because, you know, it's not sometimes we take time to start the albuterol. So when exactly is your start time for, for, for your kind of theoretical study? You know, you define your outcome and your analysis plan. And usually your analysis plan includes some sort of propensity score. So going through this is kind of the framework to, to kind of help you walk through how to, how to, how to do a causal inference in observational setting. And not all not all questions or data sets or things are amenable to this. So, or they can, there can be some big limitations. So that's important to know as well. Yeah. I think that's a great, a great place, a great overall sort of takeaway there. Martin is, is understanding sort of the targeted trial framework, because really so much is kind of comes back to that is trying again to, you have this problem of, okay, well, an RCT theoretically gets rid of the selection bias part of this. And now we're having, that's another thing we're having to do when we're adjusting for selection bias, that's what we're doing. And we have to do it in the way that you would build the RCT. And I think like some of the things you raised, it strike me like as also getting back to Rob, part of what your, your question was a couple of minutes ago, which is, you know, like in a roundabout way, you were partially asking like, well, is an RCT, should I always trust it? And so one of the things that I don't think we've mentioned that is a really underestimated or underappreciated weakness, and weakness is a strong word because there really, technically speaking, is no weakness of an RCT compared to an observational study in a vacuum. But in practice, the way an RCT works, you know, the the obvious limitation uh, or the one that most people think of it is like, what James was talking about where you it's just not feasible. There's another big bucket too, which is that you try and that you do an RCT and it gives you false reassurance and it gives you something that is internally valid because that's what RCTs do, but it doesn't actually answer the question that you really wanted it to ask. So it's answering some question, but it's not. And the best like granular the best granular example of, of those two ideas, I think, are like the one that's not feasible is, you know, the the BMJ paper of parachutes randomized for jumping out of a, you know, for skydiving. You know, there was no randomized controlled trial for jumping out of an airplane at 10,000 feet. And that was the first of those kind of spoof BMJ papers that was published. But I actually think the second one that was in that series was the more illustrative one where uh, several years later, someone published a, a response paper where they said, well, we did a randomized trial, randomizing people to parachute versus no parachute. And we found no difference between that and skydiving. However, because it wasn't feasible to randomize people who were at 10,000 feet, we randomized them while they were at ground level. And that's the kind of risk that you get with a, a lot of RCTs that you get lulled into a false sense of security there. And like what that could look like, for instance, it, Martin, if you want to pull up like uh, your targeted trial framework there again, one of the problems in not necessarily RCTs, but prospective research is we almost never actually enroll everyone who meets our eligibility criteria. I mean, for the first part, patients have to consent and they're 
that's not random. Like there's definitely a non-random reason to consent or non-consent. Two, for feasibility reasons, we, even for large, well-funded RCTs, we're usually in some kind of convenience enrollment, especially in emergency medicine and acute care research where we have 24 seven patients. So you can imagine that you, you're actually going to miss a lot of patients who in a systematic way from inclusion in your trial that would happen in the RCT that you may pick up in the, you know, the retrospective search. And that doesn't necessarily mean the retrospective search is better because it's not, but it is a fundamental difference that you have to understand. You know, one of the other things too, that like I was thinking of while you were going through this particular example, Martin, is going back to the idea before, you know, you mentioned about inclusion or exclusion based on hospitalization later. So that's what we would call a time varying effect. So in a randomized trial, you, a lot of times we don't actually account for those because we get lulled into this false sense of security where we say, okay, well, we randomized, so everything after that is fine. But really anything that happens after that is no longer randomized. Both in a randomized trial and in an observational design, you can adjust for time varying confounders in a way that at least theoretically takes care of those effects. That said, like anything else, your causal model has to be correct. And I think probably if there's one takeaway from this talk, it's that it's very hard to say definitively what is correct and what isn't, but take that for a grain of salt. Well, I'm sorry, James, did you want to have something to add to that? Oh, I was just going <clears> to, <throat> you know, the there's there's kind of the absurd examples where situations haven't been randomized trials like the the parachute one, but one real world one that I don't think people realize is that there's never been a randomized trial of NAC in acetaminophen overdose. The the one the one trial, the big trial that was done, it the treatment was allocated based on the Rumac Matthew nomogram, but no one in the actual treatment group was randomized to NAC or no NAC. It was it was testing essentially the utility of the nomogram with a 25% buffer and then the effectiveness of the treatment at preventing hepatotoxicity. And despite that, it, it is an interventional trial. It's not like pure observational, but there is no randomized trial of that. Despite that, it works great and, and we use it all the time. So I think that, well, randomized trials are ideal in a lot of situations that just because something like an observation or a treatment effect is seen in a non-randomized method, if it's it, it goes all into the idea with all of the decisions that we're making clinically is we're, we're doing risk benefit analysis, right? So we're looking at the risk of the treatment, the cost of the treatment, and the potential benefit that it might provide. And even if the data is relatively poor, if the intervention is cheap and exceedingly safe, then you're probably going to give it versus if it's very expensive or potentially dangerous, you're going to need that higher level of evidence to, before you actually decide to do that intervention. Yeah, for sure. And I guess that, I mean, that's a, that's a, a great example of kind of what I was wondering about. I wanted to ask you guys and we're kind of running close to the end on time, but uh, <clears throat> you know, do, does, I mean, can it, you know, there are a lot of assumptions that have to go in and there's a, to making causal inference from observational data, but it's just more practical for, for, you know, almost, almost always, maybe that's, that's overstating it, but you know, if you can meet those assumptions and you can, you know, sort of a priori make your causal map or, you know, make your DAG, are the, you know, you guys who, you know, know, know stuff about, you know, causal inference methods, like are the, are the outcomes as reliable, believable as those of, you know, just sort of the average RCT, just, you know, kind of in the sense of like, everyone says, well, you know, yeah, that's pretty good, but it's observation data. We still need an RCT, right? Like every, like a lot of papers end with that or something to that effect. And, you know, is that, I, I don't know. The, the fundamental problem is still the fundamental problem. You you can't observe both in, in most of these cases. If it was- Oh, right. But I mean, you can't, right. You can't observe the counterfactual and observational or um, CT data. And there's, there's sort of whatever there's, I can't remember, you know, like inverse probability weighting of, you know, getting the treatment. Um, but I don't know. I mean, right. But I, I'm not looking for like conceptual answers. I'm looking for like practical answers. Like, you know, can I believe, like, can you believe the, the, 
causal effects from like well done observational studies with you know pro pro appropriate methods like do we need to stop saying like well yeah we can't really do this until we have an rct well, i think the short answer is like yes, yes we we shouldn't be saying you can't like as a hundred percent but like the longer answer is if it's a problem like NAC or like LASIX, for instance, like there's never been a randomized trial of LASIX versus nothing, at least in any kind of rigorous way. You know, if there's a problem like that, that hasn't been able to, that, you know, isn't amenable to a randomized trial for whatever reason, we, then you, by its nature, like we've never been able to compare the observational res results with the randomized results. Now, there's obviously lots of examples where we have both observational results and randomized results. And even, you know, with some things like simulation, we can make reasonable inferences about how closely the two should be linked. But the problem is it, it just depends on the, the topic. It's never going to be, it's never going to be perfect. Because again, with observational data, you're starting out sort of a leg down. You're you're not getting that baseline selection bias taken care of. So I think a better way to think of it is how close to the targeted the target trial is this framework um, of this observational study, you know, and then depending on how, if you think that that's pretty close, it's, you know, seems like this is about as good as we're ever going to get, or it seems pretty realistic to the target trial, then the question is, yeah, so they're about 0 0.82. The, then the question is, okay, well, what would I do if the target trial results, you know, minus some degree of confidence? And then that gets back to what James said. It's all about balancing risk and benefit and trying to implement something. All right. Well, this is this has been this has been great. I guess in the last minutes, I you know, there's so many things that we didn't get to that I you know, and I could talk about this ad infinitum. But I guess I'd just like to go around and like give everybody, you know, have everybody give their like one minute, you know, pitch about their favorite thing about causal inference or like the thing that you wish that, you know, the person reviewing your papers knew about causal inference or, you know, what you think emergency researchers should know about it. So I guess we'll go in reverse. Start with Stephen this time. Um, I, it's an exciting topic. I think that's, it is fast paced moving. The, the methods are being looked at and I, I feel like it's becoming a very more, much more robust topic to be able to publish on. And my, the, the hope with talks like this, the, the hope with expanding the knowledge base of these things is that, you know, um, journals and editors and everybody are, are more inclined to you know, want to take these types of methods and papers and utilize um, some of the more advanced techniques as as Martin um, put up on on the his diagram that you know are being utilized and people can understand the the output from them. I I just all in. It's an exciting topic. I'm a big nerd on it. I I think this is fun. I could talk about this all day. And and I I really like the paper that Martin just put up. I don't know if you want to put that up or put it back in. Yeah, I think you just added it because that that. That got at the heart of what you're asking about, but I appreciate it. And this is, this was a lot of fun guys. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, how about James? You're up. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree. This is kind of the level of evidence that we deal with and worse in the toxicology world. So we're adept at being comfortable with limited data. I think that the, the biggest thing to take away is that each, each style of study has its own benefits and risks of bias, even randomized controlled trials. There are plenty of drug trials out there that the selection criteria are so narrow as to not resemble anything in real life. And so you don't want to just look, you have to look at the entirety of what they're saying. You have to make sure that it's plausible. You have to see if the if the authors, when you're reading a, an article, if they're overstating their results, things like that are really important aspects whenever you're, you're looking at observational data. And then just thinking about the feasibility. If you're doing an observational study, I would encourage people to look into all the different econometric methods that people use. Like the economists have been doing this for ever, trying to figure out ways to to look at the effects of various things, things like instrumental variables, difference and difference analysis, they're all really potentially useful in 
the and, and essentially doing what's called pseudo randomization. So I would encourage people to look more into those methods and potentially use them if you have the right situation. All right, good stuff, uh, Nick. Yeah, I mean, I think I I certainly agree with all that. I think these are all really exciting methods and that we we all need to get familiar with. In particular, one of the things that maybe we didn't touch on, but maybe I'll plug here is that a lot of what we, you know, kind of either call or, or don't realize, but probably this fits under the same basket of health services research is particularly poorly suited to randomized trials for pragmatic reasons. I mean, a lot of times you end up getting a health services intervention that you test and then the health services interventions are almost never able to be blinded. So you get bleed between groups and then you get garbage in, garbage out. And so keeping it in mind that like a large amount of, I mean, health research in general, and also I think emergency medicine and acute care research right now has a big focus in sort of the health services realm. Mm -hmm. Understanding these sort of techniques is really important. Otherwise you get Kind of, you know, what I think Martin, one of the things Martin was alluding to with that great diagram is that you, you get the paper that's just, look, we threw a bunch of things in a logistic regression model and these things came out and like, that's not good science, you know, and then these are the slightly better ways to do, to do science in that realm when you can't do an RCT. Good stuff. And all right, Martin, bring it home. Tell us everything we need to know. <laughs> I I think my co-panelists have made excellent points. I, you know, I think the the main thing to emphasize is that there's lots of great resources that are out there for this to learn more about it. There's free courses on Coursera, edX, and the like that you can take at top institutions across the world to learn how to do these DAGs and learn how to learn more about these methods. You can ask ChatGPT to walk you through it and program it for you. So don't shy away from starting to learn more about this, perhaps with, you know, some sort of mentorship, you know, uh, this, this panel included, you know, involved in the project, but I just, I recommend you jump into it. This, this, the, as Stephen, you know, pointed out the 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 availability of data is so incredible now to do these observational studies that this is the future really. And in the future is here now. And so the quicker you can kind of learn about these, the better you'll be a consumer and a producer of such work. All right. That's, yeah, this is great. You guys are super talented and I, and I, I tend to agree. I think this is these like methods are sort of like the tip of the spear and it, it's just, it's not as much in emergency medicine literature, these different, you know, causal methods. And so I think the more things like this, the more, you know, it, it's great to see that there's, you know, so many of you guys out there. And I think I can't remember who said it, but like the more this stuff is out there is discussed, people know about it. It becomes like, you know, uh, people are less afraid of like, oh, this is some fringe statistical thing that these like, you know, you know, eight nerds know about that. It's like real good stuff. So thank you guys all for uh, your time and yeah, everybody have a great afternoon.